I want to mention again a description that I have used for a long time. And it's not hard for you to memorize or to remember the description and the terms I use. But the importance of it is, is at the heart of all observable life in the 3D world. And the way I have explained it, the terms I have used most recently, is simple this, that everybody has a partner. I'm going to try and point out to you how the partnership runs all the way from the upper circuits, all the way from what seems to be one's individual consciousness down into one's apparent mortal feelings, and then down into what would apparently be a rather direct and pristine operations of the body. And yet, if you have got consciousness, as you should be able to see easily, you have got to have more than a single sampling. The senses themselves, nothing that seems to be uniquely human would operate unless you have got at least binary sampling. You couldn't hear if all you ever heard was one tone. You could not see if all you ever saw was one sight, one wavelength. You would not know what colors were if all you'd ever seen was one color. It wouldn't matter which color, but if you'd only seen one color, you wouldn't know what colors were. If you'd only tasted one thing, you wouldn't know what taste was, literally. You couldn't discuss taste. You couldn't be conscious of taste. Nobody could describe taste to you unless you had had at least what? Two tasties. But back to the beginning, the jump-off point that I want you to see that's been the basis of much human discussion, philosophy, theory throughout the ages, called all kinds of things, all the way from religious terminology to Freudian. I like my description for the time being. Of course, I always do. But I think that you should. And that is literally that everybody has a partner. Now, to begin with, and maybe to end with, but at least to begin with, <coughs> ignore, ignore any such questions as the partnership may immediately put forth, such as, what's the significance of that in blank terms? That is, what is the religious possible basis of this? Or what is the psychological ramifications of this? Or why do I have a partnership? Why does humanity, why is humanity plagued with one if it's true? Forget all that for the time being. What you've got to see is that you and everyone has a partnership. Now notice I don't use terms, although I mean a lot more anyway, but I don't use any term that has a preface or a modifier that would apparently be negative or positive, but all the ones in the past have been negative, such as an unconscious or a subconscious, which they're trying to point in the same general direction, or in other times to talk about evil spirits as being that other side of humanity, the dark side, the hidden side. Look at it this way. It's a partnership. You were born into a partnership arrangement. Now, that term by itself doesn't tell you anything. You don't know whether, if we were speaking business-wise, whether it's a successful partnership, whether the partners are getting along, or whether it has reached the point that all partnerships, I would suggest you, reach out in the ordinary world back in the city. They become a trying marriage. But just to hear the term partnership, it should be a non-conditional term. You don't know. But you indeed are in a partnership. There is nothing in human consciousness in anybody that can say and mean it, that can say, and it's based upon anything approaching objective reality in the 3D world, that can say, I and I alone, or me, me alone. There is nothing in human consciousness that can do that, which I would suggest to you along the way can be seen as the source for a cornucopia of misstatements, misnomers, ills, suspicions. But there is nothing in consciousness the way it is, in you or in anybody, that can say I and mean it, or can say me which, when you begin to hear it, is one of the things that is rather sad in an objective way, which is not really ordinarily sad, but it's to hear people proclaim themselves, to walk into the forum at the blue line level and announce, I am so-and-so. It's the first sadness, and it's more than this, it's 
<laughs> it's the first to finally hear yourself somewhere given this, yeah, that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> it is not sincere. You can be as sincere as you want to, but it is not sincere with any integrity. That is, there is no soundness to it. There is no wholeness to it. It is like a little weak voice, like a little kid whistling in the dark. But it can be a grown man, grown woman. But all things such as this seem worse for men. Well, they don't have as much going for them on the surface. <laughs> but it's for someone to say, yes, that's the kind of person I am, or this is the kind of shit up of which I shall not put, and I'll put my foot down. All you got is one, at the very best, here's what you got. It's a partnership, and one of them is on the phone. <laughs> but that's an old joke, if you don't know it, amongst business people of a certain ilk. The old, used to be called the old Smith and Jones. But when you'd call up and you'd say, uh, is this Smith and Jones business? And the guy would say, yeah. And he'd say, well, listen, I'm such and such supplier and I want to speak to you about the overdue bill. And the guy at the other end says, well, I'm sorry, I'm Jones. It's my partner Smith that takes care of the bills and he's out of town. <laughs> that is what you're faced with with ordinary people, except they're not aware of it. It is a partnership and all you've got at the best at best, is one partner is right then is on the phone and he's saying, well, we don't owe you any money. Money? We don't need money. Or so we don't handle those kind of supplies. We don't deal in those kind of services. <laughs> you simply have got to feel that there's no huge undertaking. The biggest amount of the endeavor is for me to wean you from your past ideas about that I'm surely talking about the unconscious and I just don't want to be uh, aligned with the Freudian school of thought. Or that what I'm discussing really is the dark side of human nature, the unconscious, or the, the places where evil spirits can get a toehold. All of that is conditional. All of that is a part of episodic consciousness of life. You have simply got to be aware of the fact that as you are now, there is no I. There is no me in you. There is we. As I, I'll tell you one more time. No, you can't get involved at all. One thing is of no consequence, but you can't get any further if you get involved, but you cannot get entangled in any idea about how did I get this way or where did this come from because I think you're right. I know I'm right and it didn't come from anywhere. You're in that condition because you're human. So you've got to get past the point of feeling as though there is some judgmental aspect of me being a partnership. There is not. It is simply a mortal aspect. If you're a human, you're a we. And you've got to feel that. Now I want to talk a little more specifically about the partnership. The partnership is not only the nature of what seems to be one's individual consciousness, that is a we instead of a me or instead of an I. With 3D consciousness, <laughs> Everything is apparently in a partnership arrangement. Now this is not the end of the story, and this does not mean that this is all I see or all that you can see. But if all you have is 3D consciousness, that is all you can see. But right now, you don't even see that. But there is a partnership arrangement everywhere. I want to use some of what I had already brought up in the last several meetings. A 
of the diagram this one of man the complex nexus of circuitry and you remember what I was calling the blue line last time the forum what apparently is an individual's own personality what he normally calls I it's where east meets west it's where the apparent past meets the present it's where one apparently has become civilized But I want to point out a partnership outside of just the general realm of one's apparent consciousness. There is a partnership arrangement in anything of which you can be conscious at the ordinary level. There is a partnership there, a partnership arrangement between the lower, older circuitry and the younger, upper circuitry a partnership. The partnership, to speak of it artificially in isolation, the partnership is no more aware of itself than you presently are of your own arrangement. Although, once I call it a partnership, you can, as many of you would, would say, well, yeah, I know what you mean. I've never heard that term. You just suck that term on it, but you're just simply talking about conscious thought and unconscious thought. So I was aware of that before I met you. I'm telling you that that is not the limit of it and it's not even the best approach. It does not begin to cover what I'm speaking of. And in that same sense, the circuitries themselves, if they could be isolated and spoken to and spoken of as separate entities, if they could, and if the lower or older circuits could verbalize, and I tried to speak to your lower circuits, and so are you aware of the fact that you're in a partnership? It's no longer, you're not in a possum. You're not in a bobcat or a pig, you're in an organism, a greater collection of cells, cells that has operations that are far removed from what's going on with you. And if the lower circuits could talk, they would say something like, you know, I knew something funny was going on somewhere. Now, if we move to the upper circuits, the younger ones, and tell them that, they are certainly going to say, yeah, hey, tell me something new. And there would be, of course, the ones that in our time, in our spot on life's body, would probably say, well, yeah, you're talking about unconscious motivations. But, now to stop this artificial isolation of those two, taken in toto, taken together, they do not feel, they are not conscious in any way, of them being in a partnership. Now, let me also point out, there is physically, as opposed to, for your people's benefit, as opposed to non-physical, in some way spiritual or spooky or metaphysical or whatever term you like, as opposed to all of that, there is a physical operation within the world of ideas that is a partnership. No? Mm -hmm. Well, the world of ideas, what's the whole point of the world of ideas? What's to find the what? Truth. The truth has a partner. <laughs> Truth's got to have a partner. Well, you couldn't look for the truth. You couldn't talk about the truth, and you certainly could never locate the truth unless it had a partner. Non-truth. <clears throat> but is there anything in the yellow circuits, is there anything in your intellect it would tell you that the fault is in a partnership with the true. Not a partnership. They're in some way, they're anathema to one another. They are antipodal. But it is a partnership. It is always a partnership. And if you went into the middle area, if you go into what apparently is man's feelings, the blue circuit area, you are dealing again with a physical partnership. What's the whole point of feelings? Well, so that you can pursue what you like. 
so let's say that the height of feeling is I like, in the same way that the height of thought in the yellow circuit would be the truth. What is the partnership of I like? I don't like. They're not in opposition. It is a partnership. Apparently one is on the phone at any given time. Well, yeah, this is Smith and Jones, but you need my partner. He takes care of all returns. Any complaints you got, you're going to have to talk to him, and he's in Milwaukee this weekend. Please call back. There is, at the red circuit level, there is a partnership. There is a partnership. Let me jump off at a right angle. There is a partnership that is very subtle. It permeates everything, and that is the partnership in humans between thinking of action and action. The only two possibilities for a human. The two possibilities that apparently make a human singular on this planet. that in response to what seems to be out there, the human can not only act, which he's got in common with anything else that moves, he can think of acting as opposed to acting. But the opposed to acting covers up this subtle partnership. It is not one actually opposed to the other any more than the truth is opposed to the non-truth. Or what I like is opposed to what I do not like. What I approve of is opposed to what I do not approve of. There is a partnership between the dominant and the submissive. Not a struggle, not a fight. That's why, whether you like it or not, I continue to use the term dance. It is not two attitudes, two kinds of people, two forces being in opposition to one another. It is a partnership. How about the big one from the 3D level? The big partnership. That is the partnership between life and you. That is the big partnership. That could be subtitled for those of you who like subtitles and those of you who like to go even lower than subtle. The partnership between life and you could also be referred to as the partnership subtitle between death and life. But I don't care to go into that. The partnerships, like many partnerships, out in the great uncivilized world, the partnerships are symbiotic. They're symbiotic without any connotation as to one being parasitical. It is a dual symbiotic that there is no weighted benefit flowing unless you get into the big one between you and life. But that which seems to be on the lower levels I've mentioned, they are all symbiotic in the sense that it is an inescapable dance. Although one appears to be dancing backwards. I keep saying that. I assume everybody knows what I'm inferring. It seems to be the person who is following in a dance. That apparently somebody is leading in a dance. Historically, in our part of the world, it was a male who danced forward and a female danced backwards. They called it leading and then somebody was following. But it's not like I picked out dance. It's not as though in ordinary ballroom dancing that it's improv. Everybody knows the steps, and so you can't say that the male, whoever's dancing forward, was actually forcing another person. See, it's not a struggle. The other person willfully comes out, and they simply know the step. But in their case, in a woman's case, they dance backwards. And I was using that as a very shorthand 
kind of our picturization for the submissive dominant dance. There is a symbiotic relationship between all of this, but it is not to one person's advantage. As long as I'm here, I want to point out another aspect of the submissive and dominant dance. Back to my description, if you remember a PLD, a plain life domination, that which seems to be going on back in the city, that which seems to be going on within the blue line forum. I was using at one time examples that apparently I had taken from the external world. That is, of one group, one nation, marveling in a bewildered fashion verbally over how another group, another nation, could put up with life under some tyrannical rule. When I point out that any group on this planet at any time can go overthrow the tyrant. Anybody. There is no government on this planet that I know about unless we got down to a tribal level of a dozen or so people and then it becomes self-defeating. But at any rate, there is no group anywhere, there's no tyrant that has 9% of the population in arms, in uniform, pledged to him. Because if that were true, then you couldn't overthrow it anyway. They'd be overthrowing themselves. It is not simply a matter of numbers. What I was going to try and point you toward, when you have a situation to start from that springboard, that apparently there is one group being dominated by a tyrant. What you don't understand is that the people, let us say that's the tyrant and then this group of people, that nation, that tribe, they're dancing backwards, but they're doing it as their job. And if we were going to put three-dimensional words on it, they're doing it in a pleasurable, in a satisfying manner. If they were not, it would be new tyrant time. It would be goodbye, present tyrant. No big deal. They just simply shoot him, kill him, knife him, throw him under a train. Now they just all turn at him and look at him and go, hate, 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 hate. <laughs> and he thinks, well, I believe I'll move to Spain for a while. <laughs> That's still not what I was getting at. I've been through that. But ordinary consciousness, see, does not even, it's not even prepared to deal with that. There's another aspect of plain life dominance that's beyond what seems to be inexplicable behavior from the outside. That is, of people putting up or being dominated in a way that even apparently, from your view, from somebody's view, that apparently is harmful to them. Let me take you into another area that's the same thing. How about in areas, and there's some going on right now, there always are, but I can name two that I'm assuming all of you are aware of, Lebanon and Ireland. That from a, an outside view, apparently you have a group of people, in both cases, that are beset by their own behavior that is self-defeating. Why in the world would these people get up every morning, children, teenagers, not even big enough to have hair on their private parts, and they're picking up guns, and they're going out and getting shot and shooting other children, tearing up their cities, blowing up their cells. And outside nervous systems, as always, look upon this and go, what have the gods and the anti-gods wrought? <laughs> what has happened to humanity? How can these people continue to engage in this insanity? <coughs> And they don't even have a tyrant making them do it. It just apparently is group insanity, right? Wrong. No. It is still the partnership of dominance and submission. But in this case, is that which you would have never stumbled upon. It is so far removed from ordinary consciousness. The behavior that seems to be absolutely inexplicable it seems to be people operating absolutely to their own detriment. It's still a matter of dominance and submission. They are blithely getting up each day, 
continuing on paths apparently destructive to themselves. But what's involved is the inherent distaste for change. <laughs> it is the native <laughs> resistance to any new effort. In the city, that would be, that wouldn't even rate being laughed at. It'd just be ignored. They have had years of getting up, going out and fighting their neighbors, blowing up their own houses, making bombs, which they know they may blow themselves up. They don't know what they're doing. They put in a car to drive it across town. They get two blocks away and they blow themselves up. They blow up their uncle. They tear the city apart. And I'm telling you, this is not the only possible description, but here is one that reaches into the dominance inside the unseen partnership of human behavior is they get up and do that because of the inherent distaste for any change whatsoever. But outside any particular forum, everybody else's behavior in the forum, if you're an outsider, appears to be bizarre. It appears to be harmful oftentimes. I can give you another secret, law of physics, that's impossible to see through 3D sight, but back in the forum, back in the city, but in the individual forum, in individuals, and then expanded into a collection of people representing the Lebanese, or at least those in Beirut, the Irish, at least those fighting the great religious war, apparently between Catholics and Protestants, which you notice other people, books, graduate degrees come about through people bemoaning, trying to analyze how in the world has it gone on for these hundreds of years that the Protestants in this small group are still fighting the Catholics. No wonder that make sense. You know why? That, because it doesn't make any sense. That's not what's going on. It's habit. It's the domination of habit. It is the domination of the inherent distaste and resistance for any change. That's the only reason they're doing it. The rule I was going to tell you is in the forum, in the forum everything <coughs> tends to remain as it is, no matter how bizarre, no matter how distasteful it may appear to an outside observer. <laughs> Once you begin to see that that's a fact, Jack, you got a foot up on every PhD in history in the world. All sociologists then begin to look like Daffy Duck compared to what you understand. <laughs> Just that simple one thing that everyone else is thinking, it's bad enough, this would be a good Western view, it's bad enough that my fellow Western, Anglo-Saxon basic types, are over there fighting over religion in Ireland. But then how about move on down to the further away from the Anglo-Saxon run into the Mediterranean, and here you've got groups, these, not only the Muslims against the Christians, but the Muslims are divided up into the Shiites and the Shawnees. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. These people are nuts. How can they do this in the name of religion? Now, you're nuts. <coughs> How can we analyze this? You analyze it one way. In the forum, in you, and then in the forum of humanity. Things. Notice I'm trying to be, instead of me getting crude and using curse words, I'm trying to make it sound a little more scientific. In the, in the, forum, in the forum, things tend. They tend to continue as they are no matter how bizarre or distasteful or even self-defeating, the arrangements may appear to an outside observer. Once you begin to see that, well, first off, you'll want to take a small crowbar and hit yourself in the head and go. <laughs> You'd be surprised, as always, just these small things. You'll be surprised what that begins to explain, three-dimensional at least, 
that libraries are filled, as I said, reputations made, then broken, over the attempt to analyze the great struggle going on between Catholicism and Protestantism in certain, in certain parts of the world. That's not it. They just started this going, and that's what they called it. But you've got to understand, once you, well, once you begin to see it, it's not them that's foolish once you begin to see it. It's you. You think, you ignorant son of a bitch, you. For years looking at such things, let's say that it did catch your interest, and you used to sit around even want to write poems or get a guitar and, and sing some sad folk song about the poor people in Ireland. And then for you to, th for you to try to think, let us say that you came up with a Christian background, that you got those kind of DNAs in you, and you think, oh, beautiful Jesus, the beautiful so-and-so that tried to teach peace and love, and now they've taken his beautiful idea and they're killing each other. How insane can people be? You don't have, you know, they're not insane. Once you see it, there's nobody to laugh at. There's nobody to ridicule. There's nobody to be crude in your language like I can be. If you think to yourself, you, know, you dunderheaded harebrain. <laughs> they're not fighting over Christianity. They're not fighting over Catholicism. They're not fighting over boundaries. That which is presently in place in the forum, tends to stay in place. The people get up and they fight each other every day, they bomb each other out of habit. And it just can't be, but it is. Just habit sounds real crude, and so I have to go through all this should have drawn out diagrams, <laughs> and I talk about the blue line forum, and I, I discuss this and that, and I'm telling you what it is. And it's right before your very eyes. What do you think holds life together? What holds you together, the partnership itself? If it would not have it, you would all be on the funny farm. Of course, then we're playing with three-dimensional justice then, because if all of you that way, there'd be no funny farm, this would be the funny farm. So there'd be nobody to look after you. There'd be nobody to say that you were nuts. Of course, don't discount, as an aside, that that's the way the situation is now, and you just don't see it. <laughs> so I have to go through all of this. Of course, I am being partially semi, being hemi and even demi facetious. <laughs> but it would not get anywhere to simply say, which would be the most direct way if I said, hey, Everything in the life that seems to be uh, inexplicable behavior, just from a, a reasonable, let's assume that all of you start out and you are in the bell curve. You are the bourgeoisie, you are the middle class of being reasonable on this planet. All right, everything you look at, human behavior that seems so bizarre, so self-defeating, so insane, which fighting over religion to many people throughout history, not just you, but that just seems to be the epitome of the insanity of everybody else. If I said, all of that can be explained in one word, one word and one word only, and that's habit. None of you would sit still for that. You'd all think, what the hell, I got involved with this and I climb the stairs and come up here twice a week? <laughs> and you're going to tell me that habit explains it all? You know, if you understood it. But when you see it, you'll want to go. Of course, when you see it, you realize that you can't do this because it doesn't help. You're not supposed to see it. <laughs> and of course, you do. <laughs> but they are not fighting over religion. They're not fighting over economic systems. That's why it can't be explained. That's why you try to analyze it, you or anyone else, to actually get down and use the yellow circuit in the kinds of ways that is good for developing air conditioners, to doing mathematics, to try and take the behavior of this group of people, the Jews and the Arabs, the Muslims and the Jews, the Muslims and the Christians, the Catholics and the Protestants, whatever it appears to be. It's all a partnership wherever it is. The Catholics and the Protestants are not fighting each other in Ireland. That's part of the circulatory system. It's good and healthy. People are killing each other. Children are going around maimed. I'm not in favor of it. I don't want to be around them. I don't want to live there. That's just my personal feeling. You don't have to you can do anything you want to. But there is nothing strange going on. But if you try and take the yellow circuit, as life is supposed to make people do in the city, and actually look at this. The only thing you can conclude is this group of people 
have lost all sense of reason that civilization has reached this limit. If we cannot reach these people, they've got fair amounts of education, they're from a similar stock as we are, the Anglo-Saxons, here they are, we can speak their language, they look like us, they, their customs are not that far removed from the general customs of the United States, whatever that might be. If we can't go to these people and say, listen, there's not that much difference between Catholics and Protestants. My God, get over it. Settle down, you people, and quit killing each other. <laughs> this is what, let me have a discussion with you people about theology and about religion and the purpose. You don't understand. They're not fighting over that. You believe that you're fighting yourself. You feel as though that there is some degree in all of you that there is a battle going on, that there always has been. As far back as you can remember, it felt as though you were not only battling people out there, your parents, battling trying to grow up, battling their attitudes, battling your friends, but it, well, most people it seems to be their parents, which is simply more of the close power of the blood, but there's nothing strange about it. It's not psychological. It's not you wanting to go to bed with your mother or father. That's all irrelevant. It is simply the closer you are in the bloodline, the closer your DNA is together, you're sharing what it almost amounts to, a common organism, but it's you and these other people that apparently are separated by skin. That is, that you and your mother, you and your father are almost the same people. So you're not just dealing with a partnership. Look how bad you got it already, just you inside of you. But then when you've got at least two other people, and they got their own partnership, and in a sense they're all in you because they are, then that's what apparently is all these, what do they call them? Oh yeah, problems psychological problems. But at any rate, you have all felt as though there is a battle going on that is no different than what appears to be the certain unpleasantness going on in Northern Ireland, the certain conflicts going on in Beirut. No difference. If you try and look upon yourself, which with most people seems to be more difficult, with some sort of attempted objectivity, that you try and turn the yellow circuit on, well, why do I feel so uncomfortable? Why am I self-conscious? Why do I worry so much about my position? Why do I worry about what other people think of me? Why am I like that? There is no why. That's the same thing as trying to figure out why do the Protestants and the Catholics continue to kill themselves and little children and burn down their own neighborhoods? Why? There is no why. Not where you're looking, it's habit. Remember, I've given you much more complex and apparently more challenging, <laughs> more escape-proof descriptions. Habit, were it not for the habit of you, with you getting up every day and there still be this warfare going on, you would not know that you indeed were Beirut. You'd go in the mirror and look at yourself and you'd think, well, yesterday I was Lebanon. <laughs> and now look at me, I look more like Am I Albania? Am I New Zealand? You would know what you were. The tendency in the forum is for things to continue as they are, and that is a rule. That is a law of physics, and it is beyond the pale of 3D consciousness. It's got to be. Were it not otherwise, then there would not be the tendency that life needs in humans Notice I'm still trying to sound a little more high-toned than using all those profane descriptions. There would not be the tendency within human nature to want to change, to aspire to change. But while that's going on, what cannot be seen is things tend to stay just as they are. No matter how bizarre they appear to an outside observer of that one particular circumstance. And need I even point out the childishly obvious, which I'm not going into, but outside your forum, you individually and you as a part of other teams, racially, religiously, culturally, whatever description you might try and label yourself as normally in the forum, those outside of it, given some reason, to take any notice of you, find you and your group just as bizarre. And you, 
consciousness can't deal with that. It couldn't make any sense. It really can't believe that. If I said, all right, the people getting up every morning, and I will bond out erstwhile nice neighborhoods in Beirut at one time, within our lifetime, whether you know it or not, it was the Paris of the Mediterranean, and now it's just a shell of a city. And these little children getting up, brushing their teeth, and having their Arab version of grits, and they pick up a rifle, and they go out and they try to kill other little kids in the neighborhood, and many times they get killed, and bombs are blowing up everywhere. If you told them how bizarre that appeared to a decent, educated, sophisticated, caring American, they would find you just as bizarre for saying that. It makes no sense to say that's bizarre. That's life. That's what we do. <laughs> but see, to you, you if, the, if I'm telling you this, or if the kid said, well, hey, mister, I understand what you're saying. I hear your words. But, geez, you're nuts. I mean, if you say you can't understand why we live like this, you, know, you are you are bizarre. All right, to you, that's doubly bizarre because there is nothing bizarre about that attitude. I am looking, you would think, I'm looking at behavior that is self-defeating. I'm looking at behavior that by any classification is insane. And you tell me you can't understand what I'm saying? You're telling me that you think I'm weird for saying that? Whew. See? Nobody can see that their form is bizarre to an outside observer. A little more on the partnership. You would be astounded. I very seldom get to brag on myself, but at times I am just delighted at my charitable use of the English language. Back to the subject. There was a purpose in that. It wasn't a joke. There is much that would tend to explain itself in the ordinary world three-dimensionally. If you but understood one of the basic partnerships I have already mentioned, that is, of the memories and the messages of the older lower circuits now in the verbal hands of these younger dudes and dudettes. And what they have to do with it, what they try to do with it, and you would be surprised being charitably understated again, understating it charitably again, how much of what appears to be absolutely inexplicable in life in general and in you, when you begin to see that I was not a few days back being crude when I asked you the rhetorical musical question about once you were fed and fucked and tucked in, got a warm fire going, then everything else you want, not that it's wrong, not that it's wrong whatsoever, no such thing as malum per se, not that it's wrong, but actually what else is there? And everything else that you can come up with, I kept suggesting to you and asking you to consider it yourself, everything else that you can come up with, from cars to clothes to homes to reputations, are all as though you had to take the lower hungers and you've got all you can out of them, apparently, and you have to squeeze them a little bit more. That, Jesus, I can't, I'm not going to lay here forever and watch TV. I got to do something. At least, if I don't do something, I got to think about doing something. That is, what could I possibly want to do? And it's as though you got to take eating, fucking, sleeping, and squeeze them a little bit more, and maybe they finally say, oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, let's do this. Uh... Let's get another sexual partner. Or, oh, all right, uh, all right, not just, I don't need just some kind of skins or roll up in some palm fronds. I need uh, a Calvin Klein outfit. All right, anything, just quit squeezing them. I got to do something. And so it comes up, you know, and I, you know, my feet are tired, so all right, a Lamborghini. I give up. That's what, that's what I need is I need that. The thing is, you can see them all as being 
a reflection of, another interpretation of those simple, older, nonverbal needs. It is so tricky, it is not a psychological comment, it is not a sociological commentary on the nature of man, it's not an attack in any manner. But notice the partnership. When, you're con when your consciousness is limited to the partnership, that's why I keep saying things, which I get tired of doing in a sense, of me saying, all right, hey, this is not an attack. Let me remind you of this. Because ordinary consciousness operating on a partnership arrangement only has a choice. Whatever is said is either an attack or a support of something. And it's not true. That's why there is no transonic information available. That's why there is no parallel information available in the forum. That is, there is no information that indeed to fit human consciousness' own definition of objective. There is no objective information. Oh, there's some around, but you don't pay attention to it. <laughs> That's the closest it is to objective to you. That is, any ordinary consciousness, not just you, but anything else, anything that you're conscious of, anything that you know, you can't be. Everybody knows what objective means, according to the dictionary. You've got some personal feeling about it. The closest that any human has of objective knowledge of any kind would be me to say, all right, what's some things that you're not interested in? And we just ask a few things, you know, get the needle point maybe, and you say, well, I basically know what it is. I think it's some kind of sewing that my grandmother used to do, but that's all I know. Now you're getting close to objective consciousness, and you say, well, what the hell good does that do me? I got no interest in it. Uh-huh. <laughs> in the form to have interest is to be biased. To be conscious is to be conscious in an episodic manner, and every episode has some feel to it. <coughs> the partnership that I was going to talk about for another minute, the partnership between the lower or older nonverbal circuits and the newer ones that particular partnership is the nature of the blue line form. That is the nature of civilization in general in humanity as a whole. If you want to look at it in a philosophical, from a philosophical approach, you can do it that way apparently out there. Then you can look internally and you're dealing with the same thing. There appears to be a middle ground. There appears to be, I even draw it out for years as being these three circuits when I draw it in this spatial sequence of the red and then the blue and the yellow. And that does have something to do not just spatially, although it is reflected in the body, somewhat. I'm doing it here spatially, but it is also chronological. It has to do with what appears to be the three-dimensional time growth from the red into the blue and then into the yellow. And there's no secret. That's not my theory. It's just my description, but it's, it's still around you. It's still around you apparently out there. There are groups of people, not only individuals, but there are whole groups of people on this planet right now in the same time that we are, whose development in this manner has not reached yours. The people, if they're talking, which everybody on this planet is talking now, we'll assume that. If they're talking, they've got some yellow circuit. But the development, if I was going to draw it and really play around, I'd have to draw it maybe just a half of a circle. It's not even up to the general level of consciousness. The general line level of consciousness I draw is simply the average. But then in you is that same group of people. In your nervous system is an Alabama redneck, is a conservative, reactionary, almost illiterate, is within you. There's no need for you to go out and find pickup trucks with gun racks in them and laugh. All you need to carry around, you know, when you want to have those kind of cheap laughs, all you need is a good pocket mirror from Woolworth. <laughs> there is a partnership that have evolves into a strange struggle that is completely misnamed. It is not seen by ordinary consciousness, and it is the memories, it is the messages from the older circuits, still necessary, still needed, but now they are in the hands, ultimately, of the yellow circuit who must talk about them. And this produces many from a revolutionary view, from what you would 
perhaps now think of as an objective view, it produces many, oh, let's call them at least hemi, bizarre conditions in life. One, as long as I'm here, back to a lot of people's favorite subject, there is one in particular. The lower circuits have a cellular knowledge of a particular thing that has never been verbalized to humanity in this way. They have a nonverbal awareness. It amounts to a retro memory. They have an awareness that death is not the end of it for them. If it were, you wouldn't be alive. The cells live on. Your parents may be dead, but you do understand. I'm not being philosophical. You do understand that your parents are not completely dead. Or you'd be dead. Your parents' genes, part of them, are in you. There is a cellular memory that is nonverbal, and in the lower circuits, they know they got a memory of it. It's an awareness that death is not the end of them, that death is not the end of them. If they were conscious, they would have to say death is not the end of life if they were verbal. <coughs> Comma, that's not the end of the sentence, that the lower circuits have a cellular knowledge that death is not the end of them, but then the upper ones go nuts <laughs> trying to make some use of this knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> now it's easy I guess for me to say they go nuts but that is a fair description <laughs> just right quick think for yourself uh, all sorts of just from your view I won't argue with it but what seems to be the strange offshoots the inner cults the splinter groups philosophically and religiously throughout the ages of man how about in you? How about all the strange dreams you've had? How about all the strange books, pamphlets, things that you've heard about, and as, as though your yellow circuits immediately, as soon as they hear that one guy says, well, if you join our group and eat nothing but butter bean sandwiches when you die, it's not the end. You actually come back, you're revived, and you come back, and we all live in a garage in Sausalito. <laughs> And whatever it is, for a moment, your yellow circle will go, yeah, yeah, where'd I join? <laughs> it almost drives the younger circuits nuts that this awareness is down here. But when it's looked at from, again, if we could artificially separate all the circuits, the yellow circuits look upon death. They see people lay down. You saw your mother, your uncle, your brother, your wife. One time they laid down, closed their eyes, and they never got back up and they put them in the ground, and they never got back up. And the yellow circuit looks at that, and the only thing it can say is, you know, it comes up with terms, death, end of life, end of the line, bought the farm. The people go away and they don't come back. Their spirit, the spark of divinity, all kinds of descriptions. In each person is a nonverbal knowledge, a retro memory, because they've been there. They have survived death over and over and over and over. But they're nonverbal. Compared to the yellow circuits, they're not even conscious. But you've got genes in you and everybody that is immortal thus far. They're as old as Adam and Eve. And they know that death is not the end of them. Then, as always, through this strange process, I use strange in quotation marks right quick, the information coming from these older, nonverbal levels, finally makes its way as everything does. Viruses, germs, all your blood, finally reaches up here, and it almost drives the yellow circuits nuts. Because it does not have the direct knowledge that I'm talking about, but there is the validity that there is another part of the system that knows death doesn't kill us. At least the parts that know that because we're still here. And then up here, this part is almost driven to absolute distraction. 
And when I say nuts, any such ideas as paradise, heavens, gods outside this system that put us here for some kind of test and will kill some of us if we make them mad and knows that we brown up to them and butter up to them. Let them live, or when they die, they don't actually die. It's, it's like a game. They look like they die like everybody else, but those that got my good side, they don't actually die. The rest of you fuckers, you know, you're done for. <laughs> Another way of putting this I want to point out, the substance in the blood that I told you literally exists, what I have called, for my own reasons, MV12. And I pointed out to you that literally, physically, physiologically, biologically, as you would call it, this part of the blood, this substance, is continually used up before it gets anywhere past the level of consciousness. When it hits the ordinary level of consciousness, it has done its job. It is depleted. But, as always in life, there is tolerance. There is no absolute. There are tolerances in the vivus machina of life. So, periodically, it seems as though in this tolerance, little bits of it get above the line. Just a speck, just a smidgen, of MV12 unexpectedly getting past the level of consciousness in a person unexpectedly can produce what seems to be extraordinary conditions. It produces such phenomenon as this. See if any of this sounds familiar to you. Now remember, I'm talking about something I'm telling you that I know, I'm just telling you this is not paradigmatic, it is not a parable that there is the substance and it has to do with what this is. But, quote, accidentally, due to the tolerance, due to the looseness of life itself, that life is not a machine or a piece of living machinery that is so tightly wound and constructed that it cannot move. But if just a speck of this MV12 unexpectedly gets above the level of consciousness in a person, it produces such phenomenon as this. They begin to hear God's voice. They begin to see UFOs. They begin to recall past lives. All the phenomenon that many of you in the beginning believe that I am really poo-pooing, which I am to try to get you away from that kind of thing because it is absolutely flawed, misunderstood, but there are people. They don't belong on nut farms. <coughs> Not just to make it crude, I'm running out of time on this side of the tape. People that say they hear God's voice, people who say that they actually saw flying saucers, believe me. There are people who say, I remember I've lived before. I remember I've lived before. Now, if they talk about it, you can forget getting anything out of people. They don't get anything out of it. It's the first thing you should realize that. They don't benefit from it because it's a kind of accident. But for them to say that sensually, that they actually heard the voice of God. They didn't see him necessarily, but they heard the voice talking to him. It's the MV12. It makes things become sensually true. That is, it will permeate the senses and they have nothing to attribute it to. And the most common one throughout the ages has always been what? The great fallback, the great line of defense, gods, spirits. And nowadays a variation, UFOs, people from another place. It's their own blood. It's their own nervous system. That's why nobody can ever find a UFO. The person that saw it, they saw it. Nobody else saw it. Or somebody that says, I heard the voice of God and he told me so-and-so. And other people go, hmm, very strange. We don't hear anything. Very strange. Yeah. And really strange is, like I said, it's going, I assume all of you know, it's going through a revival now. Now they're calling it channeling. People believing that they can recall another life. The yellow circuit can't recall shit. <laughs> and that's what makes it a waste of time. That's what makes it a sitting duck 
for ridicule for large parts of life's body to go, boy, that's nuts. But the cells, your DNA has had past lives. You were your mother. You were your father. You were your grandparents. And you start splitting up that kind of genetic tree. I'm not a mathematician. I forgot, but just go back eight or ten generations and what are we talking about? Tens of thousands or tens of millions of people that are now alive through you in part, but not the genes that can talk. Any genes in you that can talk and say, I recall a past life, you know, tell that gene to shut the fuck up. <laughs> you're doing that, you're doing, you're dealing now with that aspect of the partnership in you that doesn't know anything. It's been talking to you forever. It talked to you about guides, and it talked to you about doing right, and it talked about you about love. You gotta turn the tape over. I'm going to be turning the rest of this tape over to the pair of them people, except I did want to say one more thing. Not only has everyone got a partnership, <laughs> but that I'm not going into at all tonight plus we didn't have room to put up there it's not only has everyone got a twin but life keeps him or her hidden someday if I don't forget we'll go into that but I guess that's a good place to end uh, for you people in other cities at meetings, consider this an epilogue for a couple of minutes because I have an excursion to give, and then we'll plug in what it says into public tape, and we'll start to pad them people saying theirs that you can use as you see fit in the other times and other places. The excursion I want to give has to do with taking your own blue line sphere out for a walk, if not a whipping. For the next four days, I want you to do something once a day. Once a day, I want you to put on, just for it, doesn't have to be over 30 seconds, some, a minute, it's fine. I want you to put on an act, an act, A-C-T. You know what an act is, and it, just do something that's just a very little consequence such as standing in line at the grocery store and it gets up your, be your turn to pay and look down at the racks whatever is there like candy bars and say by the way how much are Hershey bars now and if the person says whatever they are 40 cents say my god 40 cents is that with nuts or without nuts <laughs> and whatever they say you say well how much what, what does that mean that they're paying for chocolate now I don't know that. Have any of you people ever heard of a candy bar? How many ounces is that? An act. That is something that you would have never done. Has, it doesn't have to have any consequence whatsoever. A good one I use in another context is just look into stores, open the door, absolutely inappropriate stores, like a bridal shop, and open the door and say, do you make keys? <laughs> And if they say, well, no, you say, well, did you ever, did you, did you quit making keys or what? And they say, well, we never did make keys. <laughs> you know what an act is. You all hear me. Do it. Once a day, an act. But now I want you to put some passion, not just verbally, not just say something that you wouldn't have said. Don't, that does not qualify as an act. It has to have some apparent passion in it. It's not just for you to say, how much are candy bars now? <laughs> An act is a small vignette. You've got to say, how much are they? When they say, you say, did you say, 50 cents? Are you serious? Well, what does that, how much, what do you think they're paying for chocolate? Where does most of the chocolate come from? In the, the person's not going to know, but you set up a little scene. One other thing I was going to talk about sometime, but it just pops up, and I might as well. It's another good time since we've rounded up some new people here in other cities. 
Do you realize that everybody in the world, everybody, is subject to hero worship? Everybody, except the real revolutionist. And he understands that back in the forum, there are no colossal figures present no matter what their title or whatever their costume is. But it is wired up in humanity. You can look at the idea of God as being the ultimate one. But no matter what you think about yourself personally within your partnership, one of you, you are the partner one, is completely smitten by hero worship. And the reason I bring it up is a lot more I could say in different ways. But every time that I do anything or let other people do something publicly of dragging in new people, such as going on here in Atlanta where we're taping this and it's going on in other cities, is it always happens every time, and I've never mentioned it in particular, and usually I, in a sense, don't even think about it in a particular way until after the fact, and that is every time I do this, we end up with what amounts to spies. And I thought a hero worship and I was talking about something else tonight, and then here we are again, I got it going on in Atlanta, and it's going on in other cities, and the strange part is, and I say strange, those of you not involved with such things, you should find it interesting, and then those really involved should find it interesting, except they won't be able to hear it, but they ought to find it bizarre squared. As I end up time and time again, people showing up wherever I am, in Atlanta here for the last few years, and people show up down here saying that they hitchhiked from Arizona, they crawled on their hands and knees from Oregon or, you know, just to see me. If they heard about me or they read something I wrote, and it turns out that their, quote, teacher, some guru, sent them. You know, go down and see if you can, you know, chisel your way in or slip your way in, which, you know, takes a real big, you know, it, it takes a huge act. It takes a lot of slippery and subtleness. But at any rate, and I have never even though when times have come, I had to finally throw people out or I would just rub them the wrong way and finally where they would pack up and leave. And none of them ever seemed to have the slightest indication, they never seemed to ask themselves that here I am, that they've got a hero, some guru or some teacher somewhere that said, go down there and get inside there and find out exactly what the hell is going on with him. Take notes or record him if you can. It's how they look on hero worship and they got somebody that sent them down here to see what in the hell I was doing and to stay here. I've had them, well, a few of you, I guess, know one guy stayed here. I'll let him hang around nearly a year just taking copious notes just all the time. And it never seemed to strike him as bizarre that I've got this guy. I guess it was a guy. Well, I know it was a guy in this case. Some great guru sent me here to get, you know, find what you're doing. And his hero worship is some guy that has to send a minion, a flunky, down and send back reports for him to go, hmm, 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 or you know, whatever he claims to be making of it, <laughs> and how they could still engage in hero worship, or I'm going to learn something from somebody that does this. <laughs> for you people, I got a piece of it going on here, and I'm sure in New York, L.A., it'll, it happens. It's not for you people in the groups there, by the way. It's not your concern to try and second guess what's going on. But those of you, as I said, it never fails, believe it or not. Those of you there doing that, don't you find that curious at all? Even if I let you hang around or I don't appear to notice, don't you find it curious that somebody that you're engaged with a hero worship that you consider to be a leader or a teacher sent you, you know, get down there and become a spy? You know, over a nothing like me or whoever it is but that's your hero if you if you still think that things back in the city that things in the blue line forum are reasonable you don't know the definition you don't know the picture of bazaar don't worry about the Christians and the Jews killing one another in Palestine or the Muslims and the Christians Look at you, taking pot shots at yourself every day. Well, hope everybody got that written down. <laughs> or some of you report back to the head guy, hey, the jig may be up, he may be on to me. <laughs> no, 
I don't know why the guy that sent you didn't realize that. I guess that was all the business. Are we ready to go with Paradigm? Yes. Run into public tape.